lives today. May the Lord bless us all as we worship him. Good morning, church family. Let's unite our voices in song and praise our God, okay? Let's open our hymns to number 286, Wonderful Words of Life.
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day, this beautiful Sabbath day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together and worship you, a day that we can set the cares of the world aside and focus on you, your creation, and your love. We ask for you to bless us with the presence of the Holy Spirit today and bring continued blessings to us throughout the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our opening song is number 624, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. It's a good quartet number, guys. If you know it, sing the parts. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Today's offering goes to the lo local church budget. Jesus saw the widow bring her offering to the temple. She gave two of the smallest coins in the temple monetary system. She waited until she thought that no one was watching because her gift was so small. Yet Jesus commended her. Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. How can that be? The rich gave large coins, but the widow gave her heart as part of her offering. A Christian writer commented on this passage, a heart of love and genuine faith in a worthy object is more acceptable to God than the most costly gift. The poor widow gave her living to do, to do the little that she did. It was this unselfish spirit and unwavering faith that won the commendation of Jesus. We may think the size of our offering makes it valuable to God, but no, the size of the heart gives value to the gift. God will take the offering we give with our hearts and magnify our, our offering into something special for his service. But does this mean that we should not sacrifice as we give? Hear the words of Jesus. 
For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. The widow sacrificed with her heart, and as a result, God blessed her gifts. Will the deacons please come forward? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath morning and the opportunity to gather here together and worship you with our full loving hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Today we will be reading a passage from Matthew 24. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Amen. Amen. All right, now it's time for the children's story, and Sheila is going to be the one giving it. So kids, if you want to go get your little buckets and go around, and the adults will put in coins and other green pieces of paper. Sabbath, everyone. Oh, my paper. <laughs> okay. Can't do it without this. <laughs> okay, I always do or try to do something to do with sweets because then the kids listen. Um, anyway, oh, yeah, thanks. Um, thank you for that. I'm going to move this down because it's a little loud. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see, there's some candies up here. And they have a couple things in common. One, they have a shell of some sort and something inside, at least for these. <clears throat> they all are a little different, right? We have some that are coated in this, and we have some that just have a chocolate coating. Um, 
but they're a little different. Like us, we're all different on the outside. If you look around, some of us have curly hair, some of us have brown hair, white hair, tan hair, whatever, uh, blonde, there we go. Curly and straight. Uh, some of us have freckles. Some of us have some dimples. And our skin shades are all different, just like these candies. But they're all, the candies have something in common, <clears throat> and we all have something in common. The candies have something inside here that is sweet. We have something inside of us. God made us. We're all the same, no matter what we look like. So you're wonderfully made. Don't let anybody tell you any different about the way you look, the way you act. You were wonderfully made by God, and he's got something special for you. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, like these, these candies here, they're made to share. Sometimes we don't want to share because they're really good, but they're made to share. What else is made to share that God gave us? Sometimes. I may not want to share. So there's <laughs> the Bible. It's made to share. So just like sometimes... It's a little hard to share with somebody some candy because you're like, oh, I've got just a couple left. I really don't want to share, but, or in some cases, the Bible, we're a little nervous to share. Just remember, God gave you a talent. We all have something different. And maybe that person, I may not be able to come, like, I don't know these people here, come up to you and say, you know, God loves you. No way. I was shaking my shoes. But being kind, they're going to notice something different. And that's how you open a door. So never think that you don't have something to offer. You do. Um, uh, John 4.19 said, <clears throat> we are loved first because we were loved. Um, so anyway, um, probably wonder why there's peanut butter right here. I just needed to throw you guys off a little bit. So I threw some peanut butter up there. Plus it's really good to like put chocolate in it. So. Anyway, uh, does anybody want to say prayer? Or have prayer. He's got all of the candy. Come on up, love. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you that we could go to church. Please help us to have a good rest of the day. And please help us to share the love that you gave us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, I like that. We all look different on the outside, but we got something sweet on the inside. And uh, I think Jesus himself said, you know, that we look on the outside and man's appearance, but God looks at the inside. And that was when choosing David, the, the, the future king. So how much more important is it for us as uh, boys and girls and men and women of God that we have something sweet to share with the world? Uh, that's the good news of Jesus and his soon return, which I think is, is going to be soon. Now is the, uh, the privilege where we get to come before God and just share what we're thankful for, uh, any praise or prayer requests. I'm glad the international travelers are back. I'm always a little bit jealous, you know, and Marlon and I was talking about breaking the 10th commandment. That's the one about being jealous of other people. But it's been so long since we traveled internationally, and I was telling my wife, honey, we're the only family that travels and vacations in the Middle East every year. Like, hey, where do you want to, let's vacation in the Middle East. So I don't know, I, I can't wait to hear stories, but uh, glad you guys are back safely. Um, all right, any other uh, thoughts, praises, prayer requests? I open the floor to you guys. Yes. David and Danny, okay. Anything in particular or just God knows? David is involved in things that he needs to get out. Something we all could use more of. Forgiveness and uh, healthy choices. Uh, I think we're all presented that with that as I thought about that as eating, eating donuts yesterday. Yes. Okay, so pray. In about a month, we're going to be camping, and so far they have not canceled our campsites. They haven't camp canceled our campsites. That's good. So we're still on for camping. That's awesome. Yeah.
Yeah, I know the lives that we touch here, she's saying thankful for everyone here, but it's not just here. Here's where we get recharged for the week so we can go out and do God's work and share the, the sweetness that God has given us. So it's awesome to be here and just get recharged for the week. That's why I look forward to Wednesday as well. Yes. Um, I would like to ask everybody to keep up and summer camp in your prayers. Um, that everything goes smoothly. They're able to have camp. And we have four members that will be working at camp this summer. So. Cool. Uh, Johnny, Emily, Preston, and Luke. So the heavy hitters yes, are there to, to do... Uh, I'm a little concerned about pranks that might go on. I've heard a lot about summer camp and pranks. It sounds like a lot of fun, but I don't know. That's awesome. So, yeah, summer camp is coming up. Pretty exciting for the kids. Yes? Um, my, my kids ask for me to request for prayer. They have classmates that are from Yamar, and um, there's a lot of things happening there if you're following the news, but there's a great need for food right now. Is it Myanmar? Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. It's my accent. It's Myanmar. I don't know. All right. Yes, it's something we take for granted, certainly, is just uh, food. You know, we, we have an overabundance and plent plentiful amount of it, and there's other places where people are going, going to bed hungry every night. Yes. Prayer, prayers for your son, uh, Billy, and just turning to God, which was our prayer for all of our kids, that they would stay connected to God, because um, that's the author of life, and if he's the author of life, he knows what makes us happy and make, what makes us tick, and so uh, when we stray away from that, which some of us have, and we realize that when we're outside of God's will, we're not as happy, we're not as content, so just prayers that uh, God would keep us all on that path. Jason, do you have something, or No. Spring and beautiful today. I thought about it as we were driving and just the, the clear nature and good weather that's coming and shorts and a t-shirt. That's where we're, I'm in my element, so I'm excited for that. Anyone else? Praises or prayer requests? Yes. Um, being from Florida, my first spring ever, I think, you know, it's so beautiful. You guys have been here, most of you, I think, and you don't notice it. But it's so beautiful to see the trees and flowers and you know, God is really awesome. Um, last Sabbath I asked prayer for my daughter and her friends that were in Colorado. And uh, we did go through some um, hard few hours because they were driving through a storm and it was, I think God, we are okay back in Florida. She was supposed to fly back on Sunday, only got there on um, Wednesday night. And so. please keep praying for Brazil because um, things are really bad there with COVID. Okay. So there's prayers for Brazil, COVID, and thanks for family traveling safely through Colorado when they got dumped down with that gigantic gargantuan storm and uh, the beauty of spring and spending it with your, your loving husband. I'm sure that was part of it too. I, I, she just mentioned the weather and the budding flowers. Obviously, I was thinking about Wilbur. <laughs> and his daughters. And, yeah, and the rest of the family, of course. Of course. <laughs> yes. So he's just thanking God for his son's birthday today. So happy birthday to you. It's awesome. Another, another year of life and, and uh, wisdom. I was reminded that verse in the Bible says, and, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature before God and man. And I think that's our prayer for all of our kids is they grow in not just stature and they get bigger and stronger, but they grow in wisdom as well, which the wisdom is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So happy, happy birthday to you. Uh, it's on the line right now. 
and Cindy, Cindy's birthday. Happy birthday as well. Uh, can I get a show of hands? Who else has, had a, has a birthday this month? I'll put my hand down, but happy birthday. All right, we'll take three out, three out of the congregation. That's, that's, that's respectable. That's respectable. Who's? That's right. David said he had his birthday as well. So happy, happy birthdays all, all around. And it's important to remember that God is the one who grants life. And another year, another year of life is another opportunity to get closer to him and another people, the opportunity to, to lead people to, to him. So if there are no further prayer requests, we'll let's, uh, kneel as we come before our maker. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come humbly on bended knee, acknowledging that you are creator, um, the author of all truth and life. And so we just want to take it just a second just to acknowledge you and who you are. Thank you for your power, your love, your ability to transform lives. I interact with people every week who strongly and firmly believe in you, and there are people who don't. But Lord, when we see the power of a changed life, we know that you're alive and well. And so we're thankful for that. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit to be with the congregation, those watching online, and with, um, with Elder Bud as he's going to bring us a spoken word. Lord, anoint his lips as he opens your Bible and um, gives us what we need to hear. Help us to be receptive to that. Lord, there have been a lot of uh, prayer requests today for uh, different things, healthy choices, forgiveness, things we could all use more of. We think about... Uh, the different needs that are around the world in Brazil and Myanmar. You know the needs there, Lord, whether it's uh, sickness or lack of food. Lord, you've blessed this country with so much. You've blessed us with so much. Help us to, to, um, to give to these programs and different things where we, we see need and where we're convicted. That is how we share your love with others. Help us also to share that sweetness, the good news of Jesus, his, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. But Lord, that you're coming soon. We cannot wait for that day. We know that the message must go out to the whole world and then the end will come. So we're waiting for that. Help us to do our part and not be ashamed of the gospel. And Lord, we think about shooting victims and different things of, that are great, bring great sadness. And we see these things. We know that uh, Satan is alive and well, but we do not want to glorify him. We want to glorify you, knowing that you know the end from the beginning and that you will make all things right. You will wipe every tear from our eyes. Until that day, help us to be your hands, to be your feet, to be your arms, to embrace people where there, are, there is a need, to shed tears when they need to be cried, and to smile and embrace and have fun, to celebrate with others. So Lord, help us to be all those things as we reflect and represent you and your character. Please forgive us of our sins so we can be right before you as our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So now it's our privilege to have special music with Joshua Katrib. So I'm going to tell one of these stories, but it's one of those terrible stories that's, I remember him when he was this big. Well, I do remember him when he was this big. And now he's grown up and into a, a young, 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 uh, soon to be young man. And uh, God has gifted him with an amazing talent. And I'm just pleased to see that I've seen videos uh, from a, a very doting grandmother who showed uh, just amazing videos, and so we're going to be blessed with the talent God has given him and that he's sharing it for his kingdom. Thank you. 
and uh, <laughs> everyone's been given a different talent. And there's part of me that says, it would be so awesome. I know the first six notes is Silent Night, but that is incredible. So praise God that you're using his talents for him and his kingdom, and it's uh, just a privilege. And it's our privilege now to have Elder Bud with us, um, obviously uh, a, a loved, beloved member of our congregation, and um, perhaps, I think, the most humble person I know, uh, always serving God, and finds a way to bring his kids here every week and to teach classes, and uh, I'm just inspired by our conversations, and um, you, you make me a better man of God because of our, our friendship, so I appreciate that about you. So I'm excited about what God is going to share with us today through Bud. Good morning, church. I'm going to leave my mask on for just a second because I want everybody to know that I truly do miss potluck. I truly do. We have some amazing cooks in this church. Amazing musical talent as well. That was an amazing piece that you played. I played piano when I was uh, younger, but I never played like that. Uh, I remember the, the, the last time I spoke, I was so nervous that I forgot to uh, thank Jetta and Anna for their, for their music. So two months late, I'm, I'm sorry, I hope you forgive me. But <clears throat> I was in a full-blown panic Wednesday night. This message has been on my heart for a couple of months. And I, uh, I started typing it. The boys were out of school a week ago, Friday and Monday. And so I started typing it up. I used a couple of work days, work from home days. And I started typing it up. And I worked on it Friday, I worked on it Sunday, I finally finished it up after about six hours of typing on Monday, and I was done, my, my head, my brain was just in a knot. And so I, I put it down, I set it aside, and I let it settle for Tuesday. I picked it up Wednesday evening to kind of figure out my approach to it, you know, to try to, try to, try to figure out, you know, how I'm going to present everything. And to my horror, as I'm reading through it, it was 14 pages long, and I realized there's no way that I can memorize. There's no way to memorize this in, in this short of time. There's just no, I'm going to have to read this entire sermon to the, to the audience. And I haven't, I haven't mastered the art of being able to read and present like I'm not reading. That takes a lot of practice and a lot of, uh, a, a lot of experience. So I was horrified. I, 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 I knew that after I read page 14, I was going to look up and everybody was going to be asleep, which... <laughs> which would be really embarrassing, especially if you drool when you sleep. And I didn't, I didn't want to put you through that. But like I said, this message has been on my heart for a few months, and, and it's, a, it's a message of preparation. It's our third one in a row. I think God's trying to, trying to tell us something. But we'll, we'll get through it. I, I created some slides. Good news is there's only 18 slides. Uh, if I get nervous and forget, most of what I want to say could be a really short message. But... Uh, but I, but I think we'll get through it. Uh, I've got a lot of blabbering to do in between the slides. And so, so hopefully we, we'll get through it fine. Let's open up with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again so much for this Sabbath day. I want to thank you for the honor and privilege that we have to serve you and to glorify you. Uh, I ask today, Lord, that you be with me, calm my nerves, uh, help me to present your message in a clear and concise manner, uh, keep my thoughts in order, and send the Holy Spirit out ahead to everyone within the sound of my voice that you would touch their hearts. And if there's just one person, Lord, that, that you can reach with this message, then I, I ask that you help me bring honor and glory to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let me turn my clicker on. I forgot to do that, Lisa. We're going to start in Matthew 16. You want to you can turn to Matthew 16 if you want to. Uh, and what we see here, or what I can't see here, I'm going to have to turn around. I can't see close and I can't see far away anymore. But we're in verses 13 through 16 in, in Matthew. And in verse 13 we see that when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered in verse 16 and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So this is a, this is a point where Jesus has finally gotten his disciples 
to confirm who they think that he is. And he continues in verse 21 because after this, he says this. He says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and scribes, and be killed and raised on the third day. So as soon as Jesus gets his disciples to confirm who he is, he starts to warn them of an impending crisis. But the disciples didn't want to hear about this. They didn't want to hear it. They never did hear it, not up until after, after the resurrection. They were focused on the big day. They were focused on Christ coming to power, defeating the Romans, establishing Israel, and establishing his kingdom for eternity, never to be overthrown. Not only were they misinterpreting the mission of Christ, but they were overlooking the crisis that was dead ahead. And Christ tried to tell them time and time again what was impending, but they, they just wouldn't see it. They wouldn't see it. So what happened? The crisis came upon them when they were completely and totally unprepared. When, when God's church was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when they should have been praying, what were they doing? They were sleeping, and they didn't wake up until the crisis was upon them. And don't miss this point. When the crisis did break upon them, what was their reaction? They fled. They fled away from Christ. They abandoned him. These are the disciples that walked with Jesus for three and a half years. They ate with him. They learned from him. They talked to him. They prayed with him. Uh, they, they watched him work miracles. They witnessed his, his grace and his, his healing powers. And they, they abandoned him when the crisis came. Are we in danger of repeating that same mistake? We're told of what a crisis is going to look like in the spirit of prophecy for us. It says, the time of trouble such as never was is soon to open upon us. We shall need an experience which we do not now possess and which many are too indolent to obtain. She never did mince her words, did she? It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. Don't miss this point. But this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. And don't miss this point. In that time of trial, every soul must stand for himself before God. This is an experience that we're each and every one going to have to experience individually. And so we need to be preparing individually. Jesus says in, in verse 24, uh, he, he tells us and gives us a hint of what this, this crisis is going to look like. We read the spirit of prophecy. And in verse 13 of Matthew 24, he says, But those who endure shall be saved. That tells me that those that don't endure, there could be eternal consequences. So we need to know what to prepare for, what to have to endure. I'm sorry, Lisa. Yep, wrong way. Right. Now, Scripture gives us stories that can offer ideas, offer glimpses, glimpses into the future of, of, of what can happen. It's called, it's called prophecy, you know that. Uh, like I said before, this, this message came to me during a, while I was preparing for an adult Sabbath school on Isaiah chapter 7. So we're going to go there and set the, set the stage for the rest of the message and read in, in Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. This is the story of King Ahaz and the troubles that Judah uh, experienced back in that day. It says, Isaiah chapter, uh, chapter 7, <clears throat> Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, <clears throat> Serious forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of his people were moved 
as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. So this is a very frightful time for the nation of Judah. It's, it's, it's a scary time. We, we consider Ahaz. He was 20 years old when he became king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord as his father David has done. And this always fascinates me how someone with the lineage of this king, the lineage of King David, it fascinates me of where did things go wrong? Where did they start to apostatize? And King Ahaz was, was completely in rebellion, in, totally, in total rebellion against God when his fathers before him were total, complete servants of God. Now, Ahaz was given to wickedness, total, given to idolatry, and even child sacrifices. He sacrificed his own son. But what I don't, I don't understand is how this could happen uh, to this man. Now, in, in Isaiah 7, we go on, we read more about him, because, because God's still trying to appeal to his heart. And he says, go out now to meet Ahaz, you, Shir Jashub, he's talking to Isaiah here, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted, for these two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin in Syria and the son of Ramalia, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have plotted against evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it. Let us make a gap in the wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabel. Thus says the Lord, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. So he's, he's trying to relate to Ahaz that it's not a problem from the outside. It's not the attacks from the outside that are the concern, that are the real danger. It's what's inside. It's what's inside his heart. But he never <clears throat> took the time to establish a true relationship with God, true prayer. He, he didn't practice, he, he didn't make any attempt at any relationship with God whatsoever. Whether it was youthful pride or, or arrogance, uh, uh, didn't feel the need, the power, corruption, the corruption of, of power. He never made that attempt. The head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin, so, so goes on within 65 years Ephraim will be broken so that it will not be a people the head of Ephraim Ephraim is Samaria and the head of Samaria is Ramalia's son if you will not believe you will not be established even in verse 11 says offers a sign he says ask for yourself from the Lord your God ask it either in the depth or in the height above but Ahaz said I will not ask I will not uh, test the Lord I was going to say tempt uh so, so we read the ultimate demise of Ahaz in Second Chronicles. He shut the doors of the house of the Lord, made for himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem, and in every single city of Judah he made high places to burn incense to other gods and provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. So Ahaz rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of Jerusalem, but not... They did not bring him into the tombs of the kings of Israel. Now, so he died in, in total humiliation, that he was hated. And we just, we just wonder why he couldn't take the time to establish a relationship with God. He, when the time of crisis broke upon him, what did he have? What did he have to turn? He had to turn to the, to the enemy of God. So, we, we have in, uh, we know that God had a people in Judah. And this is what I, this is what I want to get to in the point, is the experience of God's people in Judah at this time. It says in Prophets and Kings, but in Judah there dwelt some who maintained their allegiance to Jehovah, steadfastly refusing to be led into idolatry. It was to these that Isaiah and Micah and their associates looked in hope as they surveyed the ruin wrought during the last years of Ahaz. The sanctuary was closed, but the faithful ones were assured 
God is with us. He gives us that same assurance today. No, thank you. I've got some. <laughs> Let me take a drink. I apologize. This happens every time I speak. My voice just decides not to cooperate. Now, consider for a moment the experience of God's people in Judah. They, a large part of their population of God's people were in total apostasy. Their leaders and princes were, were uh, giving allegiance to the enemy of God. All the while, these attacks are coming in. They're fe they fear for their lives. Hundreds of thousands are going into captivity. Hundreds of thousands are being killed. Their d land is being desolated. And their crops ruined. They're, they're reduced to a diet of curds and honey. Makes me think I might need to buy a couple of milk cows for my farm. But they, they, it, was a, it was an extremely challenging time for them. Now, we discussed this in the Sabbath school class, so this might, some of you have heard this before. There's, prophecy gives us a glimpse into the future, ap apocalyptic prophecy. And an aspect of that prophecy is something called typology. And I've, I'm a huge fan. We're not going to dig real deep into this today, just kind of brush over it. But I'm a huge fan of typology. And when I was preparing for this lesson in, uh, two months ago for the, for the Sabbath school class, this, this typology jumped out at me. And it really started working on my heart. Uh, it just really concerned me some. So let's look at Assyria. There are four main players in this story uh, outside of God and, and Isaiah. One is Assyria, the nation of Assyria. And, you know, they were a rising power in that area at the time. They had influence over, they were influencing the actions of all the other countries around them. And they are a type, they were an enemy of God. And they're a type of the enemy of God today that we see in papal Rome, a growing power, growing power that, that, uh, that is influencing, pretty much has universal influence over, over everything today. We have the, the nation of Syria, a type of, the secular world today, Israel, apostate Israel, <clears throat> a type of uh, the apostate churches today, and then we have Judah, God's people, God's church. And, and during this time, we have these attacks coming in from the secular world, from the, from the apostate world, into God's people. But, but don't forget the point. <clears throat> God says that it will not stand. These are not the attacks that should concern us the most. It's what's happening inside of Judah. It's what's happening inside our hearts that matters. And if this typology works out, which I think it's pretty seamless, down to the remnant that, that survives out of Judah. We know the story after the, uh, the Babylonian captivity that uh, the, a remnant came out and returned to Jerusalem to rebuild. And I think this is a type of, of the 144,000. So I think it works out seamlessly. So let's focus in. That's all the typology we're going to talk about. Let's focus on Judah and the the similarity in the experiences that, that they faced and the experience that God's people will face before the return of Christ. Now, Kayleen went through some of these. I don't know if I inadvertently copied every, every one that you went through. If I did, it, it was subconscious. But <clears throat> these are just some of the experiences that God's people are going to experience. The false ladder rain, which is... If you're not familiar with it, it's the excitement that swells in the apostate churches. They think they're being led by the Holy Spirit when they're actually being led by the spirit of the enemy. And it swells in to the point that it brings about the Sunday laws. So we've got the Sunday laws, the little time of trouble, <clears throat> Satan's last day deceptions, the shaking. I was going to spend some time on the shaking today, but I was led otherwise. And, you know, basically the shaking's been happening since Cain, right? I mean, people have been turning their back on God and, and rejecting the truth since, since the, the original sin, just about. But, uh, but it is going to be a very heart-wrenching time for the church. And all of these attacks from the outside will, will 
climax this shaking, and there'll be, there'll be thousands leaving, thousands coming in. I'm not going to dig too deep into that today. Uh, the latter rain, loud cry, the seal of God and the mark of the beast, the close of probation, and the seven last plagues. Now, these aren't things that are comfortable to talk about. These aren't things that are fun to talk about. But we need to consider them because before Christ can come, we have to go through this period. And, we, you know, God is going to purify his church. He says he's going to do it, and he will do it. It's going to be a troublesome uh, experience, but it's one that we're going to have to go through. We're going to have to go through it individually. Uh, so what are we preparing for, if we're even preparing? Uh, do, we, do we understand the magnitude of what's about to break upon us? And if we really, if, if we... If we know that the, that the return of Christ is imminent, then we have to know that we're on the very cusp of the events leading up to that, the time of trouble. And we know how quickly things can go south just from last year in 2020. I mean, food was gone off the shelves in a matter of days. And I'm not suggesting we hoard. I still don't get the toilet paper thing. But the, you know, what, what are we preparing for? And this isn't a message to fear monger. It's not a message to discourage. You know, it's, it's a message, it's a message of, of love, really. You know, I love you guys. There's not a single person in this church that I don't truly, from my heart, love. You know, but it, it pains me to think. And, and when, I, when I speak, I use the words we and us. And it's not because I understand French or speak French. It's we and us. My, na my name's French, but I don't speak a word. Perrier, maybe. But it's, it pains me to think that some of us, or even most of us, might not be taking the necessary precautions or preparations to stand through the test, the crisis that's about to break upon us. And... It, it, it just concerns me. Now, we need to ask ourselves some serious questions, some thoughtful questions. And this, like I said, this is an individual journey, but we need to, we need to self-check. You know, where is our heart? Where does our heart truly find comfort? You know, is it, is it in the, the things of the world? I mean, it's easy to come here on Sabbath and talk about God. That's easy. But what, what do we do when we're outside the church doors, when we're at our jobs, when we're at school, when we're out amongst the world? Where, where, do, where, in, where does our heart find comfort? Is, is it in the things that we see, that we can touch, that we can feel the tangible things? Or is our, do we find comfort in the things unseen? You know, the things that require faith and trust. I've got to ask this question. Is there, is there too much complacency in God's church today? And that's a tough question to ask. I think it's a fair question. I'm not being critical. Is there too much, too much comfort, so to speak? Uh, let me word it this way. Is there any urgency in God's church today? Is there a sense of urgency in our preparations, if we're even making any? for the time that lies ahead? Is there a sense of urgency in our mission? Is there a sense of urgency in our message? These are questions that I think we need to be asking ourselves as this, this crisis looms. Now, did I go the right way that time? These are some of the experiences that God's people are going to be exp the, going through. <clears throat> God's people will be called lawbreakers. While Satan seeks to destroy those who honor God's law, he will cause them to be accused as lawbreakers, as men who are dishonoring God and bringing judgments upon the world. Great Controversy 591. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be de denounced as enemies of law and order and calling down the judgments of God, God upon the earth. Their conscientious scruples will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. 
They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. In legislative halls, courts of justice, commandment keepers will be misrepresented, condemned, or false coloring will be given to their words. The worst construction will be put upon their, their motives. There's going, to be, there's going to be persecution from the outside. There's going to be uh, ridicule, and that's one of the hardest things to handle is the ridicule. Uh, just, just the attacks will be relentless. Last day events. Satan makes one last desperate effort to overcome the faithful by deception. He does this in impersonating Christ. He clothes himself with the garments of royalty which have been accurately described in the vision of John. He will appear to his deluded followers, followers of the Christian world who received not the love of the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness or the transgression of the law as, is, as Christ's coming the second time. He proclaims himself Christ and he is believed to be Christ, a beautiful, majestic being clothed with majesty and with soft voice and pleasant words, with glory unsurpassed uh, by anything their mortal eyes have beheld. So these are going to be some really trying times. Deception will be unthought un of. It's going to be like taking candy from a baby for most of the world. So is there urgency in, in what we bring to the world? Is there urgency in our message? Is there urgency in our mission? We have a lot of people to warn. Now let's talk about some of the points of preparation. Kayleen brought up last week a beautiful sermon about you know, the, the vital presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to dissect it a little bit, but no, nothing I bring up has, can happen without the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there are three points of preparation I want to discuss. Mental preparation, uh, uh, physical preparation, and spiritual, spiritual preparation. And I'm going to have to read some of this because I couldn't get, it, couldn't get it all in the slides. So I'll make sure that my voice is hydrated a little bit. Now, Ezekiel says in 38, 7, chapter 38, verse 7, prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a, be a guard for them. Going into mental preparation first, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think what Peter's trying to say here is strap up your bootlaces because you know, it's about to get dicey. But let's look at some of the points of preparation. This thing keeps going the wrong way. Okay. What is mental preparation, mental toughness? There's something that I do want to read real quick. I can find my spot. <clears throat> it says, mental toughness requires active faith. We cannot be passive. Mental toughness does not happen magically just because we are Christians, and the Lord doesn't just give it to us. We must build and develop our resilience and emotional strength. Effort is required on our part, or effort on our part is involved. Relentless effort. Mental preparedness is an act of faith in response to the spirit within us and our trust in God's working in our life. So let's look at some of the points. <clears throat> mental toughness, faith-driven mental toughness that comes from knowing God deeply and trusting him completely. The next time I speak, I'm going to have to have the TV up here. It's like a pacifier. I can't, or, or I've got to make my type larger. I apologize. I've got my back turned to you. Paying careful attention to what matters and blocking out distractions. That's focus. Remaining calm and confident under pressure. That goes to control or self-control. Give relentless effort for as long as necessary to achieve goals. It's perseverance. Respond to adversity and recover quickly from mistakes and disappointments. Resilience. Do what needs to be done even if you don't feel like it. Boy, I really struggle with that one. <laughs> Motivation. Recognize and respond to the emotions of others. Empathy. And here's a big one. Have a positive and productive mindset in response to negative situations, energy, and optimism. Let's read this together. Don't be a seventh-day sad ventist. Have you ever heard that, that term? Don't be a seventh-day sad ventist. It's all good news. As, much, as, as daunting as the future seems, it's all good news. 
because Christ is coming soon, right? Uh, I wrote that, as difficult as the future seems. So mental toughness is, is part of the preparation process, and they're all related. They're all interwoven. You, they all complement each other. The physical, the, the mental, the spiritual, they, if you're missing one, you're hurting in another area. So let's talk about, let's talk about physical preparation. I'm guessing the coefficient of return on that wall is not, it's real close to zero. If this thing doesn't start cooperating. That is not it. Uh, uh, is that, oh yeah. Still going the wrong way. I gave away my last slide. Let's see. Ah, here we go. Okay, physical preparation. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Seventh-day Adventist, this doesn't just involve exercise. Exercise is important. You know, we need to have, have sound bodies. But the Seventh-day Adventist church has a health message. Are we living that health message? No, I struggle with it. You know, I, I come from a long line of meat-eating Methodists. And I, I struggle. I'm, I'm batting probably about 500 right now with the, with the health message, which if I was 30 years younger and played better baseball would land me about a $200 million contract. But when it comes to the health message, <coughs> I, I don't think that's good enough. I need improvement. And it's not so much, we're not, we're not going to debate meat eaters versus vegetarians versus vegans. It, it's not about that. It's about clarity of the mind. It's about it's about receiving the Holy Spirit into the temple. It's about being able to, desert, to discern God's voice, being able to, uh, to discern uh, deception. It's about heavenly wisdom. It's about being able to receive the full measure of God's Spirit that he wants to bless us with. You know, God gives us the Holy Spirit in measure. You know, is there anything in my lifestyle is there anything in my life? Is there anything on my plate? In my occasion, is there anything after the dinner plate? You know, Oreos and, and uh, dark chocolate almond milk. Uh, is there anything that, that, that's blocking that blessing from God? That's what we need to be asking ourselves. Let's see if I go the right way this time. Lisa. So we're gonna move into spiritual preparation. What exactly is perfection of character? And don't mistake that with perfection, okay? It's two completely different things. Perfection of character, in Psalm 139, 23 and 24, we read, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way uh, everlasting. Perfection of character, obedience to the laws of God through the enabling merits of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to read this part. Professed Christians who do not want to obey God's law ridicule the idea as perfectionism or legalism. We've probably all heard that. Wanting to, cling, wanting to cling to their cherished shins, they stifle the convictions of the Spirit to forsake them, declaring that perfect obedience is merely a fanatical idea. Yet what the wicked, wicked scorn is perfectionism and legalism, the righteous view as simple, clean, godly living. God repeatedly tells us in his word that he wants us to live that way. He wants us to live this way. He has provided abundance of grace for us to live this way so that we can do it. And by his empowering merits, we do it. Perfection of character is simply that. We can follow directions and steps to Christ, mount of blessing, or Christ's object lessons. 
Now, Spirit of Prophecy quotes about this matter. Our high calling, page 278, when Christ shall come, our vile bodies are to be changed and made like his glorious body. But the vile character will not be made holy then. The transformation of character must take place before his coming. Before his coming. Our natures must be pure and holy. We must have the mind of, mind of Christ that he may behold with pleasure his image reflected upon our souls. This has to happen before the return of Christ. It has to be happening now. What are we doing in our lives? What are we preparing for? Are we so looking forward to the glorious day when Christ comes in, in his glory and in his power like we read about in 1 Thessalonians? You know, the, the, the world's changed all sin is wiped out, the thousand years in heaven, the, the, the final judgment, the, the, uh, the, re, the new heaven on earth, the new earth, looking forward to eternity, are we so looking forward to that that we're not preparing for the immediate crisis ahead of us? Are we going to be found unprepared to meet that crisis? Testimonies, fifth testimonies. 466, every thought and word and deed of our lives will meet us again. What we make of ourselves in probationary time that we, that we must remain to all eternity. That we must remain to all eternity. Death brings dissolution to the body but makes no change to the character. The coming of Christ does not change our character. It only fixes them forever beyond all change. And Christ has given us no assurance that to attain perfection of character is an easy matter. A noble all-around character is not inherited it does not come by accident. A noble character is earned by individual effort. There's that individual effort. We, got, we must make an effort to, to prepare ourselves, to perfect our characters, to, to, to bring about mental toughness. Individual effort through the merits and grace of Christ. Now, there are a couple of errors that I want to talk about real quickly. I'm running out of time. Uh, the error that we can resist or overcome sin in our own strength, we all know that's not possible. Jesus says in John 15, verse 5, I am, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Then there's the error that we cannot resist or overcome sin in this life prior to the second advent of Christ. It's, it's the process that we have to be moving toward. So what exactly is perfection of character? The perfection of Jesus is in stark contrast to, to our perfection. Paul states in uh, Philippians, I can go to my next, yeah, Philippians 3.15, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Paul challenges those who think themselves as perfect, and I had to write this down because I would confuse you trying to, trying to say this, that see themselves as perfect, to see that their perfection is only a state in which they are continually conscious of their state of imperfection. They always strive, but they never arrive. So the, the third error is someone who thinks they are perfect. I don't think there's anybody in this church that actually thinks they're perfect, so we won't go deeply into that. But more on spiritual preparation. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing, prayer life. How is our prayer life? Uh, before, we, before we do prayer life, I want to do scripture. Because scripture is as vitally important as prayer life. And there's, there's a couple of points that I want to make. Are we making the time each day to spend time in God's word? Are we growing our relationship with God each and every day in his word? Are we able to defend our faith? Can we defend our faith? When, when the crisis comes and people, our friends, our neighbors, our, our coworkers, they're coming to us with questions and they're saying, why don't you just, why don't you just go along to get along? What, why do you have to be so different? Why do you have to be so stubborn? You know, can we point to scripture and defend our actions. Does anybody remember this book? 
Anybody remember that? Does anybody, can anybody tell me what's wrong with this particular copy? Yeah, yeah you're right, exactly. There's 28 now. Uh, they added one between 10 and 11, I think, Growing in Christ, if I'm not mistaken. I think we need a refresher course. And I'm not judging, but I think we need a refresher course. I think it would be nice to have some presentations where we all come in with pencils and paper, and we go through point by point the pillars of our faith, and we, we, we learn the scripture, where it comes from. We can do this on an individual basis, but it'd be more fun to do it as a group. Uh, and so, and, and start putting this scripture to memory so, so that when we are approached by our friends and family, we can point and say, this is why. This is, this is how we defend our faith. So now let's go into the praying. We have no other, none other example that we should look to for anything other than Jesus, right? So, especially so with prayer life. Now, Jesus had an amazing prayer life with, with, his, with the Father, with God. <clears throat> there, were, there were times when, when he would spend all night long, sometimes into the morning hours, sometimes all night, communing with God, and he cherished, he, he cherished these moments. These were some of the most special moments, or probably the most special moments in his life. Do we have that kind of prayer life? Do we have the kind of prayer life that we cherish that kind of communion with God? One particular season of prayer I want to focus on today before I let you guys go is the garden experience, Garden of Gethsemane. Now, we read here in Luke 22, verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly than his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, we know the story. He's, he's, in, he's in such anguish. He's, he's having the sins of the world placed on him. <clears throat> and he's, he's praying to God, can this t- cup be taken away, paraphrasing. And, but w- how does he finish that prayer? Thy will be done. Right? Then the angel comes down, Gabriel comes down. He ministers or brings words of encouragement from God to Christ, not to take the cup away from him, but to encourage him to endure to the end. Uh, so, so, so Jesus, refreshed, goes into another season of prayer, which brings us again to his condition here in Luke twenty two forty four. And what is he praying for now? In John 17, we see that he prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and then he prays for all believers. Are we having this kind of prayer life? Are, are we having this kind of agonizing prayer with God for, our, for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our family. It, 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 given the times in which we live, should we be in this kind of prayer life right now? Uh, and I'm not saying every prayer needs to be agoni- agonizing, but more often we should be, again, given the, the times that we live, in this kind of prayer for our loved ones, for, for ourselves, for our past sins. And if we're not having this kind of agonizing prayer life, this season of prayer, we might need to ask ourselves, why not? Why not? Ellen White says in in early writings, I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries, (coughs) excuse me, pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety expressive of their internal struggle. I'm I'm going to drop down to toward the bottom. Some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them, and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left these and went to the aid of the earnest praying ones. I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were struggling with all their power to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But his angels left those who made no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them. She continues in the great controversy. The season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger. A faith that will not faint though severely tried. The period of probation is granted to all who prepare. There's that word. I've I've repeated it how many times? Prepare for that time. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. His victory is an evidence of the power of importunate prayer. All who will lay hold of God's promises as he did 
and be as earnest and persevering as he was will succeed as he succeeded. Those who are unwilling to, to deny self, to agonize before God, to pray long and earnestly for his blessing will not obtain it. Don't miss that point. Wrestling with God, how few know what it is. How few have ever had their souls drawn out after God with intensity of desire until every power is on the stretch. We need to be in this season of prayer. We need it right now. Right now. When waves of despair which no language can express sweep over the suppliant, how few cling with unyielding faith to the promises of God. I'm going to end with really good news. You, I gave my slide away. Jeff knows what this is. <clears throat> Anybody remember what this number represents? That's the number of promises in the Bible. That's uplifting. I like that. I think I'm going to make that my last slide on every, present, every presentation that, that, I, that I come up with, if you guys would have me again. But the point is this, as we close out. Jeff likes to tell me, and he says it with a smile on his face, his infectious smile. He, he looks at me and he says, Bud, there's a storm coming. And he says it with a smile because it's good news. Again, it is good news. I, I want to be counted among those who make it through to the end. Or at least martyred along the way. <laughs> you know, I, uh, some of you might have to endure to the very end while I'm sleeping peacefully in my grave. I, I would accept that. I might even feel bad for you for a moment. But all kidding aside, my prayer today is that we all, every one of us, would, if we're not starting now, that we begin to contemplate the crisis ahead of us. It's not fun to do. It's not fun to talk about. But we need to contemplate it and I would pray that we all start making the necessary preparations if we haven't already started and if we have to continue those preparations and improve on them because I need lots. I, I'm not ready. I'm not ready, and I think, I think a lot of us are probably in the same boat. My prayer is that everyone would make the, the, the preparations necessary to endure to the end and be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. stand for our closing hymn, which is number 216, When the Roll is Called Up Younger. <laughs> Thank you.
Heavenly Father, as we leave this church today and we, we go to enjoy the rest of this Sabbath day and we, we carry, carry out into the world in the coming week, please bless us with your presence. Please, please help us to carry you to the world beyond in our hearts, in our actions, so that your glory and your character can be shown to all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.